And now I'd like to give a very warm welcome to Dr. Jessica Fall, co-investigator of the Health and Retirement Study, Dr. David Johnson, director of the Panel Study of Income Dynamics, and Dr. Nick Valentino, professor of political science and research professor in the Center for Political Studies at the University of Michigan. Jessica, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jenna. I'm gonna start by sharing my screen or the way we start all these things this time. Uh, well, we'll just go from here. I can't reach the button I want. Oh, here we go. Okay, here we go. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. I'm gonna spend a couple minutes here talking to you about the health and retirement study, one of the studies uh, that is run from the Survey Research Center at the Institute for Social Research. Um, and it's a lot, it's a lot. We've been around for over 30 years and I'm gonna try and condense everything we've ever done and are doing now into 10 minutes. So we welcome questions at the end. So some key features of the health and retirement study, it's a multidisciplinary longitudinal study of a nationally representative sample of people in the United States over age 50. Um, it is, has large minority oversamples to facilitate research uh, on Black and Hispanic populations, and it is internationally comparable to over 30 different studies around the world. So people who are interested in cross-national research can also use our data. And it is uh, made for public use. Uh, you know, we are funded by the National Institute on Aging to collect these data and make it available to researchers. So that is definitely a key part of our mission. The aim of the health and retirement study has always been to assess the health status and preparation for retirement of successive cohorts in their early 50s and as they begin to think about retirement. So we've been around since 1992 and we're continually enrolling new members every six years. Um, so we follow the, the trends in the population in the United States. We have a lot of different content areas. I won't go into all of them, but largely we're focusing on things related to health and health services. We have a lot of detailed measures of cognition uh, and uh, detailed history on labor force and employment and occupation, their economic status, family structure and uh, family dynamics. Um, and also expectations, so how people make decisions and uh, what they anticipate will happen to them in the future. The survey is big and long. It's about 5,000 possible questions and we interview people every two years. Each person's interview, uh, they will get about 400 questions and it takes between an hour and a half to two hours. We're sometimes on the phone and sometimes in person. Um, it's a lot of computer programming to get here, and it's also a lot for anal analysts to navigate the steps and using the data. But to facilitate that, we have good documentation online, and we also provide a lot of uh, trainings for users who want you know, to come and learn from us and get their, their hands dirty uh, with some lab, labs and tutorials. And increasingly, we're moving a lot of those trainings online. But that core survey is just the foundation of a much larger structure. We also have administrative linkages to a lot of different databases, including Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid claims, uh, data from the Veterans Administration. We get employer information on people's pensions. And then we have a really growing uh, number of files that we consider what we call our contextual data resource. So these are mostly geographic linkages to things like the census and environmental data or maybe the availability of healthcare and healthcare providers in your area. And so a lot of people are interested in linking the survey data to these type of linkages to get sort of richer uh, data on these types of things. So the strength of the study really comes from being able to combine these different sources of data. So I just wanna highlight some examples that have been uh, in the press. So this is from the New York Times, and this was a series of uh, papers that were looking at the epidemic of loneliness among older Americans. Um, and in particular, they were combining our survey data with data that we have from our venous blood draw. So uh, there we measured venous blood samples and a large majority of our respondents to measure inflammatory markers, among other things, including CRP, which is C-reactive protein, and IL-6, as well as vitamin D. And what they found is that people who reported higher levels of loneliness 
um, also had higher levels of inflammatory biomarkers and lower levels of vitamin D. So this has health consequences both for cardiovascular disease in terms of the inflammatory markers and for bone health for, uh, and the likelihood of being severely injured when you have a fall if you have low vitamin D. Another example on the health, uh, the health field um, is combining our survey data with Medicare claims. So here, uh, people looked at primarily at Medicare data and our cognition data from the survey to see that people who had sepsis, which is a systemic infection of your blood, um, who are hospitalized had significant cognitive impairment and functional disability um, if they survived the infection in sepsis. So we can see how people do in the long term after they have significant life and health events happen to them. We can also use things like the Medicare claims data to quantify how much all of this costs and give national estimates of those types of things. So this paper in the New England Journal of Medicine looked at the monetary costs of dementia in the United States, both in terms of how much resources were being paid for people uh, in hospitals, but also for caregiving, but also the loss of wages that households or family members might incur because they have to take um, a leave from their job or maybe start working part-time to care for a family member who has dementia. So we can use all of our data resources to really help quantify the impact um, of disease and disability in the United States. More recently, uh, again, because we're constantly out there interviewing people, um, we uh, are able to look at the impact of something like COVID-19 in real time. So the pandemic coincided almost exactly with our 22 wave of data collection. So that forced a lot of modifications to what we do. Obviously we couldn't interview in person. So we moved everything to the telephone, but it also provided a lot of opportunities for us. Um, we, will, we will, were well prepared in terms of having longitudinal data that came before the pandemic and having a lot of biological data that we had collected prior to the pandemic. We also have the Medicare and Medicaid linkages that I mentioned, but we were able to add a lot of new content to our survey that specifically asked about people's experiences with COVID. And we've also sent them a separate mail survey in 2021 to find out how things are going now, you know, 12 to 18 months later. We also conducted a antibody test uh, in the mail using self-administered saliva kits to find out who had actually been infected with COVID at the time. This was prior to vaccinations being available on a large scale because we wanted to identify asymptomatic infections and see how well could people actually report to us whether they had been infected. And from studies like these, we can learn a lot of things. Like we were able to see um, what vaccine hesitancy might look like. Um, and we found nearly 30% of people we interviewed were not like reported they were not likely to get the COVID vaccine. And I think we have seen that roll out sort of in real time since then. But we can also relate things like vaccine hesitancy to other traits and behaviors that we know about the people we interview. Um, for example, the likelihood that they were the likelihood that they reported whether they would get a COVID vaccine actually corresponded with their likelihood to have gotten vaccines in the past. So the great majority of our hardcore resistors did not get flu shots in the past, for example. So we can see whether these behaviors were unique to COVID or actually something that we could predict from behaviors in the past. We can also line up our data on COVID from other data sources. So here we're looking at uh, the prevalence by county. So we are representative um, of the US population. We're in every state in the United States interviewing um, and our uh, percent of prevalence of COVID being reported among our respondents actually corresponded quite nicely to the county level prevalence um, in the United States as reported uh, from that geographic database. So we knew we were doing a good job capturing sort of the, the differences in geographic variation when we did our antibody uh, study. And what we've learned from our antibody study is that our self, the self-reported rate of confirmed positive virus tests, so these are the number of people who could tell us they had tested positive for the virus, was about 5.6%. But the number of people in our antibody sample who tested positive for antibodies was over 21%. So there's some sample weighting that we have to figure out here, but really what we're able to say is that you know, really only a quarter of people who were actually infected with COVID could accurately identify that they had been. So we had a lot of asymptomatic cases that were happening just prior to 
uh, vaccination. Um, and that the great majority of older Americans, um, uh, a larger majority of the population um, on the eve of the vaccine uh, rollout did not have antibodies to, to the COVID virus. So this is sort of importantly sets us up for the future. We'll be able to follow and see how these people do over time, um, you know, both in terms of uh, chronic disease and hospitalization and, and things like loneliness and how this impacts the relationships with their families. So that is a lot of what is happening right now is COVID related um, that we wanted to tell you about, but you should go to our website, which is listed here on the bottom of the page for more information about the data that we make available to the public um, and also our upcoming trainings if you're interested in learning more. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Fall. Um, and now we will be moving to Dr. Johnson. David. Thank you. Um, and, and thanks for uh, inviting me to participate and talk about the, the, the PSID. We view this as building America's family tree, the PSID. So I could do it basically just say ditto to everything Jessica said and just sort of give you a little background, but we have a lot of the same stuff, but I'm going to focus on, on, on some different, different things. So, see, okay. Um, so the PSID has been around for over 50 years. It was started under President Johnson when he declared an unconditional war on poverty. And the key thing they wanted to know is they wanted to know what, what happens to people in poverty. Do they move up? Do they move out? Um, are they there for a long time? And they didn't have any survey. So they came to University of Michigan in 1968 and said, hey, can you help us collect these data? So since 68, 1968, we've been collecting these data on these families over time. So there's about um, 10,000 families in, in the survey. We have information about over 80,000 people over this 50, now 50, I can't even do the math, 53-year um, period um, industry. And so we view this as like building America's family tree. And sort of like Jessica said, not just do we have the PSID, but we have other studies. So we view this as a families of studies, and we can do this because of the funding from National Science Foundation and the National Institute on Aging and NICHD as well. And they also then allow us to not just collect the data on these 10,000 families, but then go out and collect more data on either the adults, the young adults who are there, or the children who are there, and we can follow them over time. So we have this wealth of studies, just not just on the adults and who've been there for 50 years, but their kids and, and their kids and their kids. And so back in 1968, this is some examples of what these families could have been, and we can show you how we can build this family tree. So you can see one of these families had three generations living in the household. So we, we collect information about them. We collect information mainly about that, that parent family and, and all the adults in the family, and then we follow them over time. So we see 1980, there's some of these Children have moved out of the household and formed their own families, and we can follow them. And we follow them into 1995, and and the and the a fourth generation appears in these families, and more people in the fourth generation, and then even a fifth generation. So some of these families are massive. Some of these families, the, what we would call a family clan, have 28 to 30 families just in that clan, all related. And what's really interesting is you can see over time from, from wave to wave or every other year, as Jessica said with the, with the HRS, you see changes where people are living. They live, some kids live with their uncles and aunts. Sometimes they live with their parents and you see all this family dynamics. So it's really important to see how the family dynamics can affect their well-being. So as of, this is 2017, I haven't an updated to 2019, which we just released, but there are some people in the survey who were in the seventh generation of an original PSID family. And there are 13,000 who are in the third generation. We have about 1,400 adults who are part of what we call a triple, where we have the, 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 the 
the adult child, their parent, and their grandparent. And just recently, we also linked to the 1940 census so we can find out even more about those, the parents of the first generation. And hopefully in the future, we can link to more censuses. The 1950 census will be out next year and find out more and more about these families. So what can we do with this? So we have all these families and we have them over time, but we also have all the information about them over their lifespan. So this shows the income of different cohorts as they go through their lifespan. And you can see that that older cohort, right, that one of the dots at the bottom, they had lower income than all the other cohorts over this period. And you can see the younger and younger, but what's really interesting is this blue cohort, which would be the older millennials or younger Gen X is depending on how you do the cut. And you can see that their income is slightly lower than the cohort before because they started work during the last recession. So what's gonna be really interesting over the next five to six years is we will be able to find out how their income unfolds after the COVID pandemic. So again, they hit the first recession, and now they're hitting another recession, will their income fall or will it just go up slightly? So this is one of the big advantages of the PSID. And not only do we have their income, we have their consumption, their wealth, their education, um, a lot of health variables, just like Jessica said, a wealth, a wealth of variables we have about these people in all these families. So I wanna sort of focus on what we, what, what we can be set up to do to look at this COVID pandemic. As Jessica showed, um, HRS added questions, we did so in the PSID. But the big advantage of the PSID, as is the HRS, is we were collecting information back in 2019, before the pandemic hit. We have their employment, we have their income over the entire period, we have their health status, and then we just went out again, we're currently collecting all their information in 2021, but we're asking about their income from 2020 and their employment from 2019 and their health status from 2021. So we can see their health status change from before the pandemic to, well, what we thought would be after the pandemic in 2021, but it certainly currently in the pandemic, but we can find their income path, um, their employment path, if they lost their job, or came back to their job, and all those transitions we'll be able to look with at as we collect this 2021 data. The other thing that, that, we, that we were able to do is um, Luke Schaefer um, presented, he's the head of Poverty Solutions. He presented at a recent ISR um, about the impact, and here's one of his slides, and here's what he's claiming. Consumer spending is above what it was in 2020. Hardship considering below. Poverty fell because of government aid. Credit scores and credit card debts fallen. Um, people are behind on their rent. Checking accounts balances. All of these points will be able to confirm using the PSID. We collect spending. We'll be able to see was spending in 2021 higher than in 2019? What about hardships? What, what are the impacts on health? We can look at their poverty. We can look at the effect of government aid on their poverty. We can look at their credit card debt and we can look at their mortgage payments. We can look at their rent and see if they were behind their rent and their checking account, all of this stuff. So what's inter interesting is this is stuff that looks like it's not as bad as you would have thought with the pandemic. The PSID will be able to evaluate and see if this is really happening. Um, then as, I, as, as Jessica said as well, we um, ask questions, oops, we also ask questions about the pandemic. And so we, we said, we found out that 60% of the people are vaccinated, about 9% of them went to the doctor and found out they had COVID, 74% received both of the economic impact payments um, last year in April and in December and 25% had a family who worked from home, and 51% actually had one of what would they would call an essential worker. We also then were able to ask them, well, how did you deal with these financial difficulties, right? If you had financial, well, lo and behold, right? Like all of us, all of them cut spending. That's what everybody did, right? Some of them had to use savings, but what's really interesting, you know, almost 50% filed for unemployment insurance, and 
over 30% of them use food bank or support services. So we can then look at this and compare that to their actual experiences of what they, what they actually experience with their, with their income or their health. The final thing I wanna end on, sort of like Jessica talked about the, the use of the data. So we, these are the number of publications we've had since we started back in 19, the first one, I think the first publication was in 1969 using the PSID in 1968, which is amazing. The fact that they, we collected the data in 68 and actually somebody actually had a pub in 1969. Um, most people are using data that are like two or three or four years old. Um, and, but it's gone up steadily. In fact, what is happening now is one every every one and a quarter days, a new publication comes out using the PSID. And what I think is most important is we have over a thousand dissertations. And what's really interesting is we have we have PSID families of dissertations. In other words, somebody wrote a dissertation whose advisor wrote a dissertation using the PSID, whose advisor wrote a dissertation using the PSID. We have three generations of people using the PSID. And in in instead of looking at some of the press, you can go to the website and see the press, is the PSID is everywhere. So there was a segment of John Oliver um, last week tonight with John Oliver, where he talked about school segregation. And he referred to a paper by Rucker Johnson, where Rucker used the PSID linked to all the geographic data to then find out what, where did kids grow up? Did they grow up in a segregated school or a desegregated school? And he found out that the black children who grew up and lived in with a desegregated school district um, did better when they became adults than the ones who did not. And he found out that the whites children who grew up in the de did did no different. So blacks were helped by having desegregation and whites were not harmed. So using the, the longitudinal nature of the PSID, and you can look at the YouTube um, right there and look at it. And so we have a number of people who use the data, um, economists, sociologists, we have 13 Nobel Prize winners. In fact, I'm hoping next week on Monday, David Card gets the Economics Nobel Prize because he's an avid PSID user. We have a, a number of the associations um, use it. Um, and like I said, lots of publications. If you want some of the data, you can go to ICPSR and everybody who writes a publication in many of the journals then deposit their extracts on the PSID repository and open ICPSR, and you can find their data and replicate what they've done in their publication. Um, other things we're looking for is collecting by immigrant, um, looking at new immigrants. We're also gonna be collecting saliva and looking at multiple generations of, of families with saliva, something that I don't think there are surveys that have three generations of saliva collection, um, looking at impacts of COVID and more generational research. So if you want, to, to, to really look at the data, you can go to our website, psid.org, get started, look at the videos, look at the publications, um, search the variables, or you can follow us on Twitter. So we have a Twitter handle and we post these papers who come out one every one and a quarter days. We post them up on our Twitter page and you can find out more information about our survey. So thank you very much. Um, and I hope to talk to you later with questions. Thank you very much. That was very informative. Papers every one and a quarter days. I love that little takeaway. That's pretty fascinating. And now we will pass it over to Dr. Valentino. Thanks very much, Jenna. Wow, this is a tough act to follow, two, two tough acts to follow. But one of the things I hope that comes through in three the three of our presentations is um, how wonderful it is to work at the Institute for Social Research with this rich history and um, fantastic inter interdisciplinary and collaborative spirit that we all have. And it just makes me so proud to be colleagues with people like David and Jessica and to be working on these really big projects that benefit so many students and colleagues around the world. Um, hopefully everyone can see this uh, presentation is, I'm the, uh, I've been working on the uh, American National Election Study since 2010 as a, a member of the Board of Advisors and now as a, an associate PI. And I wanted to just do a brief presentation about some of the resources that are available to the public, uh, the, uh, the scholarly public, uh, as well as journalists and, and students around the world. 
Um, this is a project that has been going on for um, since the 1950s. So it's got it's the longest running uh, cross sectional time series of American of, of public opinion for any democracy in the world. And uh, one of our great one of our great the things that we're most proud of is that we take very good care of the sample quality as well as the uh, measurement trends, measurement quality for uh, political variables, how people vote, why they vote, uh, how they, what do they care about in terms of issues. And um, we then make all of this, uh, we, we interact with, with use, the user community every year through the, the board of advisors, as well as reaching out to users directly to try to incorporate their ideas into the, into the study as best we can while maintaining this con continuity. So one, one of the really interesting uh, obstacles for us in 2020 was, of course, that we had planned on a face, this is a face-to-face -face survey. Uh, at least there's always been a face-to-face -face component until 2020, but the pandemic really um, prevented that because it was impossible for us to send interviewers to people's homes in the summer of 2020 before the election. And so we were forced to really move, pivot quickly to an all web, an, an all in on a an, uh, web based panel, a mixed mode panel with web and telephone, and then a new mode, which we used, um, which was trying to get people into environments like the one we're all in now, a video uh, conference mode. We used uh, Zoom to try to get people involved in the in the in the survey. This is a long survey. It takes 90 minutes and there's one in the pre-election period and then we revisit those same individuals in the post-election period. You can see what we did here in 2020. And again, I'm, these slides will all be available to you and you can visit these uh, links if you would like to look at the data yourself. You can see what we did in 2020 is that we were we went all online and we had 8,200 um, pre-election interviews. Most of those were just web-based interviews using a ra random uh, sampling methodology. And then some of, some of our respondents were randomly assigned to get a request to have our interview via this video conferencing mode, video mode. What we learned, we learned a lot through the challenges of the 2020 election. We learned that people don't like to be interviewed via this format. They don't like, this is an unnatural format, even for people who are very familiar with the technology. And it, and it's challenging to build the kind of rapport that we like to build when we're in someone's living room and talking to them about politics and getting them to open up about their, about their views. So what we've, so we could call that a challenging um, um, moment, and we could we could cry in our soup. But we're actually going to be using that moving forward as a very important set of lessons learned for how we can move away from a very expensive but high validity mode of interviewing to one that's less expensive and also might be able to build high quality data sets. When we did get people into the um, video mode, I want to mention in 2020, we got very high data quality. So people did open up, but people were very reluctant to, to, to take our, our, our invitation to, to join us on Zoom and, and do these 90 minute interviews, as you might probably guess. So uh, an, another thing I'd like to mention about the 2020 sample is uh, the 2020 study is that it, it re-interviews people from 2016, which is really critical for us uh, because obviously 2016 and 2020 were in many ways historically unprecedented elections. And we really want to, just as David mentioned, we want to we wanna see if there's change over time within individuals in, the, in their political attitudes and behavior. We would love to be able to link their political attitudes to some of these health behaviors and economic uh, factors that Jessica and David both mentioned. And we think we can do that because we have built in a lot of instrumentation um, on COVID. We, as political scientists, we've noticed that there's just a tremendous amount of politicization going on for all sorts of variables that didn't used to be politicized. And COVID is one of those mask wearing, 
vaccinations, highly partisan differences, large partisan differences in whether people are willing to wear masks, socially distance, and get the vaccine. So that's something that 2016 and the 2016 and 2020 study can help us, uh, help us evaluate. There's also another really interesting and important study um, that we, we've started to build in 2020, and that is what we're referring to as a social media study. It's a different sample and a different set of questions, a smaller survey. But if you look at that, uh, it's a, it will be available soon. It's not available just yet, but it'll be available soon where we've actually been able, with permission from Facebook, to link people's polit the political content on their Facebook page to a set of political questions. It's the first national, what we think of as the first nationally representative sample of um, Facebook users that will link to their political behavior and the political content that they place on their own pages and that they see from other people. This is, as you might guess, a topic of very high interest among younger scholars. There's a whole generation of scholars interested now in political communication that understand that social media content is really important. Um, there's a lot of other really interesting resources that AS, uh, ANES has built and that we're going to continue to improve upon. The, the, the time series now uh, it contains data from 1948 and all the way to 2020. Soon all those data will be available in one data set where you can look at time trends. Uh, there's a tool online we call the question search tool, which will allow you to search all the questions that we've asked and see if there are any that are interesting to you, your students, your colleagues, et cetera. And there are summary pages we've built so far, we're going backwards in time, summary pages available from 19, uh, 1992 to 2020. Now I'm noticing that I don't have my, I don't have my um, clock up, so I'm hoping I'm not going over too much, but uh, there's another tool, which is the guide to public opinion and electoral behavior. And that's the one we're going to be using to produce. Uh, we're producing from the cumulative data file, which I just mentioned, 2020 is not um, is not available yet. Thanks very much, Jenna, for that notice of my timing. Um, this is really fascinating because uh, we can look at things like trust in government over time. You can see uh, that trend, which does not, which for those of us who study democratic performance and legitimacy is not a good trend. You can see there that trust in government has declined. We now uh, trust our politicians about as much as we trust used car salesmen. And that's not an, I, that's an actual figure that I just mentioned. Um, so many, many of us are working on ideas like that, looking at change over time. Another really interesting thing that we're doing is uh, a collaborating with the General Social Survey, the GSS. A portion of the ANES 2020 post-election questionnaire is going to be administered on respondents to the large General Social Survey in 2020 as well. So we'll get their economic and social and sociological measures, very deep and rich sociological measures that we don't have space for on the ANES for public opinion uh, variables, and we'll be able to combine those. So for the first time, we'll really be able to crosswalk information about people's, not just their superficial demographic information, but more like the kind of information Jessica and David talked about in terms of their income dynamics and their, and their um, uh, uh, social, social behaviors. And as well as a lot of very innovative measures on, on on uh, COVID. So we're, I knew I would only have a few minutes with you today to tout the, the, the huge archive of data that we've now collected over the last 70 years with the American National Le Election Study. I'm really, really proud. One of the proudest parts of my job is my affiliation with this project. And um, I remember when I was 18 years old as, a, as an undergraduate, I remember sitting in the uh, aisles of the library when we used to actually go to the library and look, looking at the publications that have that were coming out uh, using ANES data, and then to imagine that someday I would be here at Michigan with people like uh, Dr. Fall and Dr. Johnson and, and many many others working on this fantastic project is just the pride of my career. So, please um, feel free to 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 visit our page ask questions of me or of other members of the team, and I can help you with that. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful 
wonderful conference, wonderful meeting. Thanks very much. Thank you to the three of you. You just, it's slightly overwhelming to hear of how much is out there. And it's its kind of hard to wrap my mind around it. Um, it's, it's tremendous. Um, I do see that we have a question from somebody. Um, I won't say their name just in case they don't want it said, but it is, did the pandemic introduce a sample bias against those who are technically disconnected? Right, I did read that correctly. Um, does anybody want to chime in with an answer there? It depends. <laughs> So, I mean, at least in the case of the health and retirement study, we're very cognizant and aware that especially older adults may not have access to the same, you know, technology, resources, smartphones, or even internet access. So that is why we mostly interview in person and by telephone. Um, so if someone doesn't have a phone contact, we do go to their doorstep. So it's quite old fashioned, but um, that means that we have good coverage and we're representative of the population in total and can have, uh, you know, make sure our estimates are more generalizable. But it does mean that, you know, at all of these studies are facing these problems that, you know, increasingly we're having to do a lot of mixed mode interviewing to accommodate both people who would prefer to be uh, interviewed on the web. Um, and also people who really, you know, where that's not a, a possibility at all. So I'm not sure that the pandemic actually introduced complications in terms of mode, but actually just the rapid integration of technology in our lives complicates um, and provides opportunities for how we collect data. So I can jump in. So the, this year was the first year that PSID actually had a web um, component and sort of had a sort of question to to, to Nick as well. And our survey is 90 minutes. So we found a lot of people who did it by the web, but what we did is we invited about 4,000 of them to the web first. Um, but then after five weeks, we started following up with calls. And so a number of those people um, completed on the phone, even they were first invited to the web. And some of them actually asked to be. So we haven't looked at the data to know if it's biased, but we're hoping that we provided them so many options that, that they'll, they, they could choose the phone or the web. Yeah, I'll, I, I, I agree, David. The sequential mixed mode design, the, like you're talking about, is actually quite effective at increasing uh, sample quality and, and response rates. So giving people the option, once they've, once they've told you they're not comfortable with a certain interview mode, to give them the next option is, um, has been demonstrated to be a very effective uh, uh, way to go, and we are planning on doing that with, with increasingly with the ANES. I think it's a necessary thing in the world we live in now. Um, and yes, techno technology was a problem for us. I'll just mention, uh, well, it's a challenge that we have to, all of us probably eventually have to try to overcome with regard to uh, the, the video mode that I mentioned for interviewing folks, they they just were very reluctant. It was kind of interesting. Some of the responses we got, people weren't comfortable with the technology, even if they had it. Some of them didn't have it. They were worried about slow connections. Uh, all of us are, you know, but there was a very strong correlation between education rates and willingness to do what we're doing now and do a, a Zoom kind of interview. So these were all really important things that we need to learn more about and, and maybe hopefully try to change be, because in, you know, the kinds of surveys that the three of us have talked about, while their value is clear to us and clear to the value to society and to users and to scholars is clear, they are very expensive. And the money that we spend uh, in, in terms of this these data, we think, of course, well worth it, but there's always challenges. And so any way that we can to try to reduce those uh, pressures or live within those fiscal constraints uh, is something that we all have to do. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, so another question that came in is what ethical issues, if any, do you see arising from working with and using data sets from companies like Facebook that collect user data without secured or securing informed consent according to typical research standards? That one's clearly directed at me, um, I, I, I am very 
sympathetic to this concern and to this challenge. Um, I will say for the in in response to this question with regard to 2020, uh, first of all, that the users themselves all consented to, of course, to allow us to take a look at the variables that we were interested in, and we didn't get full information about every person, everything a person uh, saw on their own page. We, for example, don't have access to anything that they're. We don't have access to the identities of their friends or the or the kinds of uh, content, personal content that they put on their page. This was strictly the political content that they posted, that they chose to post, or that was posted on their page. So the political advertisements, the partisan kinds of information that they saw, this was all strictly the political information. So yes, there, there are very important ethical uh, challenges here that we needed to address. But at the same time, in order to understand, I mean, it, it's a timely question that was asked, obviously, in a timely topic. In order to understand whether the kinds of reports we've seen in the news over the last couple of days about the uh, quality and um, bias of information that people are seeing in this environment it, are true. Um, I think that scholar, sc objective scholarly standards need to be applied to the collection and analysis of these data. In the old days, when we had three major news networks, you could simply hook up a VHS machine to a television and record pretty much everyone's information environment, their public political information environment. We can no longer do that. And as, as a discipline, it's been really challenging to figure out exactly what everyone's information environment really looks like and how that affects their attitudes and behaviors. Should we be sanguine or not about the fact that so much misinformation appears to be uh, circulating via social media, including on Facebook, but as on many other platforms as well? So I'm, I'm very sensitive to this and I could go on and on about what needs to be done about it. But of course, I'm biased because I'm a scholar very interested in answering these questions um, rather than uh, shying away from these difficult decisions because we're worried about interacting with firms perhaps that have different standards than we do. So excellent question. Thank you for that. Another question came in that I believe was for Jessica. Um, is it possible to use the biomarkers from HRS to predict future health outcomes like heart disease, dementia, and so forth? I've always wondered if my high cortisol levels from stress in the past two years is shortening my life. Well, we can't answer the question about cortisol in particular because we don't measure that. It's notoriously difficult to do, but yeah, I didn't go into it a lot. Uh, or in my presentation, but we do have a lot of biomarkers that we've collected really since 2006 and expand, expanded those a lot in 2016 um, and also added genetics and now epigenetics and RNA sequencing data. So um, yes, that is precisely why we collect it um, is to be able to, to figure out what are good indicators of future outcomes. Uh, in particular, we're focusing a lot right now on biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So we are using our sample to test a lot of promising biomarkers that have worked in a clinical setting, but haven't necessarily been tested in a larger representative sample, um, you know, with diverse survey participants where we know a lot of information about other chronic diseases and other uh, biomarkers um, on them for the last 10 years. So. Um, we're really hoping to, to play our part uh, and contribute to science in that way. But yes, that's precisely why we collect them. We hope that they'll be useful longitudinally. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see, it looks like we have answered all of the questions so far. Do you guys have anything else that this has brought up that you would like to um, talk about? No, that's right, totally so I have a question for Nick then. So, so did you find, so were people okay doing a 90 minute web survey? Because Jessica, yours, HRS isn't even close to that long. Right? I know, I'm like, I feel like the three of us need to get together. Yeah, talk, I think we need to, yeah. Talk about the internet, talk about this whole Zoom yeah. thing. Because <laughs> we, you know, we've done internet interviewing and 
you know, the people who like it, love it. Some people even sit down and do the whole darn thing in one setting. Yeah. You know, but we're talking also about, you know, do we, as, you know, telemedicine maybe becomes more common. Do we offer a sort of Zoom or uh, FaceTime type thing? Um, so I'm really, yeah, interested, Nick, to hear more about, you know, who that works for and who it doesn't. And you know. Yeah. Actually, let me interject because I had a question about that as well. I was wondering, you talked about, you know, evaluating how it had gone and trying to tweak it so it's better. And I was wondering if you had ideas on how you're planning to tweak it so that it works better, which kind of goes along with what um, David and Jessica were saying. Thanks, Jenna. Yes, I, uh, the team does have some ideas. Uh, we're in an interesting situation right now in this very month, though, because we our team is writing a grant to be given the next uh, award and to continue the work. And my guess is it's at least possible that there are other people writing that same grant in the audience today, which is great. And um, but I, I rather than talk a lot more about our plans for solving these challenges, I, I think what I'll do is, is mention to Jessica and to David, first of all, I would love to get together with you and not just on Zoom, because it would be great to actually meet in, per, in the real world and, and talk about these things. Um, uh, and I'm really open to that. And I mean that very seriously. We, I, I was frankly surprised as well at how successful the internet uh, the move to the web was for us because exactly for the reason you said this is a very long survey we do provide um pretty large incentives to complete the survey but my guess is you guys do too probably similar in size so um we do you know the the web creates some challenges for data quality you you can't necessarily prevent people from logging off and logging back on or going to the web and checking their answers to questions about what they know about politics or um, all sorts of challenges like that. But actually, surprisingly, um, drop-offs were not a problem as much of a problem for us as we thought. Now, we, we do want to have a variety, as you pointed out, of modes that we can access people's inf uh, opinions with. So actually, what we're really hoping to do, and we haven't really got a lot of experience with this yet, is move, is allow at least use in our design some paper and pencil versions of this very long survey. Now, no one's really done a lot of research on 90 minute long, what would be a 90 minute long, you know, 100 page booklet of questions about politics that a person would fill out paper and pencil and then send back to us. But it turns out a lot of folks, and you might you might have some experiences with this, really prefer that mode. It's just that it's a lot of material for them to go through and to respond. So I think that's actually the much bigger challenge for us is to get access to people who would prefer that mode via paper and pencil. Uh, yeah, but, but the web has not been a big challenge actually for getting completions. Yeah, our experience have been people who like us to come visit their home really like that. People who like the internet really like that. It's when you want to start alternating things on them that that starts to become a problem. So, you know, one of the things that we're looking at as a longitudinal survey is, you know, do we experience more resistance on an internet, a prior internet person who, who we're now asking to go visit face to face, you know, to collect biomarkers or physical measures? Are they more resistant? to us coming back in that mode. And, and really it's the data consistency over time. Some measures I have no doubt can easily be, be translated no matter what mode you use. Other things are more difficult. So when we think about how we measure cognition, it's not the same thing to do it in person versus do it online. And we need to think about for us, our longitudinal consistency on some of those items. So for the survey methodologists out here, this stuff is sort of ripe for, <laughs> for your analysis. Um, and, uh, and for a long time will be sort of how studies like ours really deal with these issues, both in, both in terms of accommodating respondents and keeping response rates high, and then also consistency and validity of data. I, I uh, sorry, we are going to have to wrap up in just a minute. Um, any last minute thoughts? I'm feeling a lot of love right now. I'm like, oh my gosh, all I, can I come to the meeting? <laughs> when you guys get together. <laughs> no, this is fascinating. Um, and it's really cool to see 
like I think all three of you showed some very specific ways of how your data is actually doing good. Um, Jessica, I can't wait to see like uh, actually all three of you in like three years where you've gone with the additional data you've collected and how you're impacting health and elections and all of these different things. It's just tremendous. So just a huge thanks to all three of you for being here. Um, just go forth and uh, keep doing your thing because it's pretty awesome. Thanks Thank very you. much, Jenna. Yeah, You're thanks welcome. for the invitation. Maybe yeah, next thanks, time we'll all be in person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank the participants. Go check us out on the web. All three surveys are up there. Yeah. You just absolutely, absolutely. Um, everybody who has attended will get a copy of the slides, which has the links in it and everything. So, okay. Well, you guys have a great day. Thanks okay. a lot. Bye.